Hello, my name is Jeremy Levy, and I'm going to give this talk on my experiences on in mentoring undergraduates at the University of Pittsburgh. When preparing for this talk, I was forced to think about what were my own motivations as well as the motivations of anybody viewing this. And so I asked myself, what, why would I actually want to mentor an undergraduate? Uh, one of them is, of course, uh, academic. Uh, an undergraduate, properly trained, can contribute significantly to research effort. Uh, but there also may be financial reasons. Uh, it's, of course, well known that the NSF strongly encourages the uh, incorporation of undergraduates in, uh, in research and uh, this helps with the broad, broader impact of the research projects that are funded by NSF. Uh, and finally, uh, the mentoring of undergraduates is uh, an innately rewarding experience, although the reward tends to come much later. It's a delayed uh, reaction. So a similar type of uh, calculus pertains to the undergraduates themselves. So one is that they may be interested or curious about research and just simply want to try it out uh, as opposed to the academic coursework that they are used to taking. They also, they also may simply need money. They want a summer job and this allows them to do something more interesting than flipping burgers. And finally, uh, they suspect that Research may be a rewarding experience. They may know somebody uh, at a more advanced stage of their career uh, that they uh, that they see that they would like to men uh, emulate at a later stage of their own career. Well, as a faculty member, it's important to be able to identify undergraduates who would be interested in doing research, and. The recommendation that I have for uh, faculty who may be viewing this is to try to find somebody who, uh, well, a dealer, if you will, who would be able to uh, help you, uh, pair you with undergraduates who are interested in research. So, for example, if you have a dean or honors college, they may be able to identify somebody. Or if uh, whoever is teaching honors physics may have a group of bright, motivated students from which you could choose or they could choose identify students to join your research group. Here at the University of Pittsburgh, those two were the same person. So the founding dean of our Honors College, Alex Stewart, who unfortunately passed away recently, was also the teacher of the Honors Physics course and he used to pass along the best and the brightest from his class to our laboratories and we will miss them greatly. But there may be also a number of programs that you can avail, uh, that students can avail, that uh, would allow those students to work in your group and attract students. So for example, NSF has a research experiences for undergraduates programs. They can either be institutionally granted or individual programs. And this is a great way for un undergraduates to become involved in research. You may also be teaching that honors course, uh, or you may elect to teach a course that would put you in contact with students who would then um, might be interested in, in doing research with you at a later point. Uh, and of course, you can simply advertise, and there's a, there are a number of ways in which you may be able to do that and directly solicit students. So there's a question of when undergraduates should actually begin their research experience. And I'll give you my perspective on this. I really think that they should begin in the summer. And there are many reasons why that is the case. Um, it's important for them to really dive in head first. And, and I believe that they should not take any summer courses as well. Uh, some students are hard, to, it's hard to pull them away from their books but really the research experience is, is fundamentally different uh, from the academic research where you have well-defined boundaries and courses and so forth. It's much more important for them to treat this as a full-time endeavor and to organize their uh, knowledge, their coursework around 
why they're doing rather than the other way around. Uh, it's also very important that you constantly feed these students with uh, enough, uh, enough activities to keep them fully occupied, that they are going to, to dive in, uh, in a fully immersive experience. It's important to make sure that they always have something to do. So the question of uh, who should really be the mentor, now uh, in the examples that I'll be, giving you, I'll be giving later on in this talk, essentially all of them were, uh, were mentored by me personally, although not exclusively. So what I would say is that everybody should be uh, helping to mentor a, a, a student who is uh, joining the group as an undergraduate or any new person uh, for that matter. Uh, that student should be encouraged to always ask questions and so forth. But at some point, uh, it's, there should always be one go-to person where uh, when all else fails, they can go to that person and somebody needs to take primary responsibility. So that can be the faculty member, it could be a postdoc, or even a senior graduate student. So one of the people I would like to profile is Vanita Srinivasa. So she was a, an engineering physics major at the University of Pittsburgh when she began a research as part of a Pitt RU program. And in the, sum, in the, the, the summer, she had, uh, she had just taken quantum mechanics, and I gave her a project which I thought would fit well with, with her interests. And actually, the, she ran with that topic and uh, ended up being her first publication. And now she's actually a graduate student, a senior graduate student in my, in my research group, and it's probably uh, less than a year away from graduating. And she is uh, exclusively doing theory in my group, and uh, uh, everybody else is actually an experimentalist, but this has worked out very well for her. Uh, she has been the recipient of many honors, uh, including the uh, Varga Fellowship, which is a first-year fellowship, she also received an NDSUG fellowship, which is a, a very exclusive three-year fellowship. And then uh, in her fifth year, she also uh, availed of the Mellon Fellowship here at the University of Pittsburgh. So Vanita's research, uh, which pub uh, uh, resulted in a publication, was uh, initiated while she was an undergraduate in this RU program. And basically what she had done was taken a, a simple problem and fleshed it out uh, to, to a surprising amount of depth. And basically the system consists of a Heisenberg spin one-half chain, and this is an effective low energy Hamiltonian for uh, a number of systems that are of interest for quantum information processing applications. So the idea is you have a Heisenberg exchange interaction, and the exchange strength can be modulated from one side to the next, or one one bond to the next. And the idea was that if you had a dimerized exchange and then you had a kink, that this top topological feature would manifest itself in a localized spin state. And that's exactly what she observed numerically. Uh, she was then able to uh, figure out a way to, to move the, the, the topological defect through the system and in doing so was able to move the quantum bit. And she uh, later, after doing the numerical simulations, she was able to come up with an analytical model, which was a quite sophisticated, actually, um, uh, that allowed for um, uh, capturing the essential features of this system and explaining uh, both how it is that you can preserve the quantum information as you move the, the, this uh, spin one-half quantum bit in the chain, as well as uh, the, the ultimate limits, the speed limits for doing so. So there's a lot of under, other interesting features. If you create two domain walls, this is a space-time diagram. These two domain walls, each of them contains a spin one-half excitation. And it turns out that, that because the Heisenberg exchange interaction preserves the total spin angular momentum, if you begin in a fully dimerized state with no kinks, then that's a S equals zero state, and that retains its uh, total spin value as you create these two domain wall pairs, and so it turns out that those two states are necessarily a forming a singlet. And that's nice because it's basically an EPR pair that can be used for 
um, as a resource in, in quantum information. So uh, at the APS March meeting this year, Bonita has uh, continued her research in, in other related topics and is actually modeling the uh, energy spectra and spin properties of um, uh, spins in a uh, quasi uh, in a one-dimensional chain where the spin orbit interaction has a constant and a spatially varying uh, transverse component and what she was able to determine was that you could actually implement spin resonance in space rather than in time and this is very interesting for future ways of implementing quantum computing. Okay, so um, the, the next question is, how do you choose the research topics? So regardless of the actual topics themselves, it's, I also believe that it's important to have at least two distinct projects. One of them might be their main project, the other one might be a minor side project. And it's important because it's, uh, then they can bounce back and forth by, uh, w without um, basically uh, losing time, so they can always uh, work on something while maybe in the background they're processing or maybe they're waiting for some equipment to come in. Uh, it's also very important even if they're doing something that seems very minor, maybe, maybe it's a soldering job, maybe they're make, maybe making a cable, but it's important for them to see the big picture. Why are they making that cable? What will that cable allow? What kind of research will that cable enable? And it's important for them to learn about that big picture and it's, uh, you don't want them to get lost and uh, just the soldering. And so uh, another student who's actually working with me this semester, although I say I don't like to have students begin their research in the spring, turns out that there's a, a program called the First Experiences Program. And this is a program that basically it's, treats research like a course, which is not my ideal, but nevertheless gives uh, freshmen an, uh, a chance to learn about research and uh, maybe then they could continue that research uh, in the summer and, and, and in the future. So Rachel is uh, an undeclared major. She's uh, taking introductory physics and she uh, signed up for the research project that I posted and so I actually gave her two projects. One of them was uh, a, the modeling of a one-dimensional quantum ratchet and I'll explain a little bit later what that means. The second project was something that uh, rather new that I've been doing with new graduate students. I thought I would try it also with the undergraduates. was basically to give her a project in which she was asked to interview several group members and ask them all some maybe three questions uh, and, then, uh, and then record their responses. Hi, my name is Rachel and I'm a freshman at the University of Pittsburgh. This semester, I'm participating in the First Experiences and Research Program. My mentor, Jeremy Levy, suggested that I interview some of the group members in order to understand how research is conducted. So I came up with three questions, and here are their responses. And my name is Chen Chen. I'm a postdoc in uh, Professor Levy's group. What do you think is the effect of being able to conduct research in a team environment? Usually, I mean, I, my experience is if you want to get some feedback, you know, the, probably the only thing you need that is to, to ask. Like uh, some people may need help and you contribute, and sometimes you may need help from others and other people will help you. And, and don't afraid to ask. If you have some problems, don't afraid to ask. Every week you do research, you will encounter some problems. And maybe you, you cannot find the reason of this problem. However, some experienced uh, members, they may be encountered this problem before. So they may have some valuable, I mean, suggestions or advices. So if you show the problem to them in the group meeting, and uh, usually they will give some good feedback. I think the, uh, the most important effect is that it should make things easier. Uh, to be able to uh, to bounce ideas off of people uh, or, or get help, for example. Um, I think doing research by yourself would be uh, very difficult. So Patrick Irvin is another 
student who has uh, progressed uh, through my, uh, my research track. He began as an undergraduate at the University of Pittsburgh doing research and he was a sophomore basically working. Uh, he took Alex Stewart's class and Alec recommended him. And uh, actually after an, an, a couple of years he uh, began doing lots of research and in fact uh, is uh, the second author on a, a Nature article which is actually my highest cited work. So it has more than 400 citations so far. So after being an undergraduate, he stayed and did graduate work with me and uh, is working, was working on a different topic, uh, time-resolved spin spectroscopy and semiconductor nanostructures, and actually has stayed even as a postdoc and uh, uh, doing work in yet another field, uh, looking at optical and transport properties in oxide nanostructures. So uh, Patrick's research was uh, actually quite sophisticated. It was uh, among the most sophisticated experiments that we were doing at the time. And it involved uh, use of femtosecond laser that was synchronized to a, a microwave source, so this phase locked to this microwave source. And that source would then excite a ferroelectric thin film. And then we would use a home-built confocal scanning optical microscope to, uh, to look at the electro-optic response of that film as a function of time, so we could then uh, stroboscopically sample this electro-optic response and, uh, and then scan the beam across in a diffraction-limited spot at different times. And what you see here is an animation of a, this electro-optic response of a thin film of barium strontium titanate. And this is all done at, at room temperature. What we had seen in uh, many investigations of these, this family of uh, structures is that the, uh, the response is always very inhomogeneous on the scale, the smallest scales that we could resolve. In fact, since then we had done near field measurements and could resolve features uh, small as 25 nanometers. But in this experiment we were doing a time resolved confocal experiments and it was this technique that Patrick used to study a new structure, which was strontium titanate, which was grown commensurately on a lattice match dysprosium scandate substrate. And to our surprise, what Patrick found was that the response was quite uniform over several micron scales. So you can see the contrast here. There's a pi phase shift that's occurring that we believed was related to some um, um, dislocations in the film but in the, in the coherent regions, we see that there's a very uh, uniform response. And it turns out that this material uh, was a, a very good tunable dielectric at microwave frequencies. And that was what led to this uh, publication in Nature. So this, uh, these microwave measurements were, were key to the, our understanding of the, the, the nature of the ferroelectric state at room temperature. So strontium titanate is normally not ferroelectric even at the lowest temperatures, but it gets shifted by the, uh, by the strain from the dysprosium scandate. Now, uh, essentially all group, all research groups have group meetings and uh, we have ours with an extra E it looks like. Um, but in, so in, in our group meetings uh, everyone talks each week, so we have a large group, but it's, uh, and it's uh, one of the important things is actually to keep everybody to time. And we all have separate, smaller working groups, but basically everybody's expected to produce PowerPoint and they're expected to summarize the previous week work, the problems that they're having and their future plans. And uh, everybody's encouraged to chime in and give the, their constructive comments. One of the things that we do is we also we record our group meetings and the idea is that ultimately when uh, technology improves we will have a transcription that will allow us to search these group meetings and find uh, nuggets of information that could be useful in the future and uh, as a way of um, retaining some of the information that is inevitably lost when, when people leave the group. So here's an example of uh, uh, one of the 
sessions of our group meeting. And uh, this is the IV I, uh, I have now. You say it's less conductive when the light is on than when it's off? Which one? That's here? Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is what I saw then. But this is also different from what I saw yesterday. Yeah, I fixed that problem. What was the problem? Uh, one PNC cable is dead. PNC cable is dead. Yeah. What did you do with the PNC cable? I threw it away. You didn't like torture it first? No. <laughs> the way it tortured you? Well, it tortured me. I usually like to just, like, snip it up in 10 more places and yeah. light it on fire. What? Cover in the trash. <laughs> 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 but you don't want anyone to be like, oh, look at this DNC cable, it fell in the trash. <laughs> yeah. You to be like, unrecognizable. There's an element in the lab that's true. <laughs> okay. Okay, so um, you may have uh, wondered uh, perhaps the, uh, the camera cutting back and forth between the different participants. We actually have a, a special unit that has five cameras and it takes a, an annulus of video and then determines from the various microphones who's speaking and then automatically cuts to that person. So we do this basically to record at group meetings and so forth. And you, could, you could see the video transcription was far from perfect but I believe that they will improve over time. But here's another student, Chuck Sleesman, who actually began his research as a freshman and he was part of this first experiences program. So he didn't really do very much in that, uh, in that uh, s uh, spring semester, except perhaps he may have learned that this was something that was interesting to him. And if that's the only thing that it does, then perhaps it's okay. Um, but uh, since then, he won many fellowships, um, probably would have won them anyway. Uh, but he also was a co-author on a recent science paper. And now he's enrolled in the PhD physics program at UC Berkeley. So Chuck's research was uh, looking at the ferroelectric uh, properties of thin films of strontium titanate that were grown uh, commensurately on a silicon substrate. So he did uh, piezo force microscopy and uh, he was actually the third author on this paper. So here's another segment from this video. What initially influenced you to get into this line of research? Uh, I really liked quantum mechanics as an undergraduate here and um, so I really wanted to do a project with uh, quantum theory and uh, Jeremy actually uh, gave me a project that met my interest exactly, so I just went with it. So uh, here we, we tend to do everything ourselves, so uh, from you know, building all the equipment and uh, setting the lab up, that's, um, you know, there's lots of hands-on uh, activities that you do, so, which is different, I think, than other fields can be. Learning phase from college, that's like for more than 10 years. Uh, and physics is like part of my life now and, and it affects like the way you thinking about the world, about the nature and and I mean doing physics is really fun and you basically you are discovering things like people don't know like add, adding knowledge to like, like humankind that's like big picture. When you're going about conducting research do you ever use other scientists findings and is that you find that helpful? Sure. I mean, right now I think the research is more or less like a, a multi a dis discipline. Like you cannot just focus on the, your own real real field. Right? You have to open your eyes. And when you become more senior, then uh, lots of the time the question that the problems you are facing are not something that that can be answered within the group, and it it makes a lot of sense and try to look out and see what other people have already done in this field. When you do experiment and try to understand the data, of course, you have to self-educate a little bit and try to read through the literature. 
and learn that specific kind of theory or approaches to modeling. Ricky Garden is a, another undergraduate student who joined my group in a more uh, uh, unconventional way. So she began actually as a work study student. She was not doing anything related to physics. She was basically uh, doing cleaning and organizing in my laboratory. I have uh, several work study students of this type. She was an industrial engineering major and basically got interested in the science by uh, osmosis and she really liked the, the work environment. She worked a lot in the same room as Vanita and they had many discussions and uh, so I said sure you can come and do, do research in, in my group and she actually developed a, a closed cycle cryostat that we are using for transport measurements and this fall she has accepted to the, the the physics PhD program at the University of Pittsburgh. She was taking a lot of physics courses that she hadn't taken before and is uh, catching up and um, making her way towards the research track in physics. So not every student who joins with the intention of being a physics major ends up staying a physics major. So Scott Rothenberger was also a, uh, a student that Alec Stewart had recommended and he joined my research group and I gave him uh, a, a few different projects. Uh, actually this was a, a little while back, uh, 2005, and I know he graduated and, and was not working in, in physics but I hadn't kept track with him and while I was making this talk I actually got the uh, Honors College newsletter in which I saw his face and he was actually uh, asked to comment on his career as an undergraduate and the influence that research had on him and I was very pleased to see what he had written um, about his experiences working in my group. And actually it was only a few weeks before that that I also thought of Scott Rothenberger because he was working, uh, a graduate student of mine was uh, talking with me and it became clear that he didn't understand a few things about how lock-in amplifiers worked. And so I gave him some, some resources, uh, uh, background literature to read, but I also gave him this uh, LabVIEW program that was written by Scott Rothenberger to, and this program actually simulates a working lock-in amplifier and, and simulates all the function, the block functions become very clear. And so I'll show you how this thing works. So basically it's, uh, it's generating a sine wave and that comes from this p p block and then that sine wave gets demodulated. So there's a mixing going on here and then low pass filtering and then uh, displaying. So basically you have a frequency here, there's a sampling interval, you can add noise, and because it's phase locked you see that the, the X and the Y channel are displayed as a vector. There's a bit of history that you can see kept here. This is also the X and the Y channels, the X and the Y channels. And if you turn off the auto tracking, then of course your uh, frequency here will not be the same it's off by 0.2 hertz and you can see that now as expected it will move across at a rate of 0.2 hertz and then we can turn off the noise and so forth and change the filtering if you turn off the filtering then of course it looks um, it looks kind of strange but it all makes sense if you understand how a lock-in works so all of these the, this is actually an example of how an undergraduate winds up in absentia after he has left teaching graduate students, which is a sort of an inversion of the, the, the standard uh, assumed uh, hierarchy. Well, um, most groups also have a journal club. And I'll tell you how mine works. Uh, basically, everybody is expected to read and discuss a paper each week. And so this is a little bit different maybe from, from some groups. 
uh, everybody has to sign the pizza attendance form because if you're going to eat pizza, um, so we provide pizza every week, then you have to fill it out. It's a university requirement. Um, so one thing that I do that's perhaps a little bit different is that I'm, I encourage the, everybody to read these papers very superficially. Uh, it's like reading just uh, it's like reading People magazine in the supermarket checkout. You're, the idea is to, do, to, be, so to be constantly reading, uh, surfing, if you will, and basically the, you know, it, it, there will always be certain papers that you will be expected to read very carefully. But most of the time, you just want to be reading lots of paper. You don't want to read five papers carefully. It's more important to read 50 papers lightly and to get a broader view, perspective of how research is conducted. So basically every week we have uh, a number of papers that come up and we have lots of discussions about these papers, um, and, uh, but there's a low expectation and we want to, people not to feel intimidated by the papers themselves, but rather that they should be thought of as uh, uh, trying to elicit what the most important or interesting aspects of the research is, even if they don't understand it all. Okay, so here's another chapter from the video interview project. When you're going about conducting research, do you ever use other scientists' findings, and is that you find that helpful? Sure. I mean, right now I think the research is more or less like a, a multi-discipline. Like you cannot just focus on the, your own real, real field. Right? You have to open your eyes. And when you become more senior, then. Uh, lots of the time, the question that the problems you are facing are not something that, that can be answered within the group. And it, it makes a lot of sense and try to look out and see what other people have already done in this field. When you do experiment and try to understand the data, of course, you have to self-educate a little bit and try to read through the literature and learn that specific kind of theory or approaches to modeling the so uh, getting back to the project that I gave Rachel, uh, it's important to choose a project that will be matched well with a person's background. And basically the research that we were trying to do was to, uh, was, requires a high level of expertise in quantum mechanics, which clearly uh, Rachel has not taken quantum mechanics yet. So uh, as a way to do a simulation, of course, when you do simulations, you make approximations. And so we were going to approximate this quantum ratchet in one dimension as a classical system and treat uh, electrons as particles. And I'll show you actually, so Rachel used this software called FUN, it's a free software. And here I'll show you the narration that Rachel made. This is an animation demonstrating electron motion through a sawtooth potential. We're going to start with having all of the electrons represented here by water on an even level. The movement of the box demonstrates temperature. The water, or the electrons, are only able to travel from left to right, not from right to left, due to the potential presenting a sharp wall only to the left of the electrons. We're hoping to see the same sort of behavior in a real physical system. This animation was made using software called FUN. So to summarize, if I had to, to epitomize the approach that I take is basically you want to treat undergraduates as though they were future graduate students. And this approach I, uh, I also do with my graduate students to try to treat them like future postdocs and postdocs I treat like future colleagues. And the important thing to remember is that undergraduates are the future. Thank you very much. So here's just a list of the various students that I've had over the years and the support that has allowed these students to be compensated for their research and their time. Thank you again.